Going forward may not be the answer. Maybe I should go back. Hi, so the new OGL doesn't look too good for you. You're kind of upset about it. You don't like how predatory it is to the content creators. You're not sympathizing with the company's goals to monetize you harder. But you still like playing the game. You've got knowledge about lore, about the monsters, the classes, the races, the spells. You don't want to go to Pathfinder or Call of Cthulhu or some knockoff dungeon crawler classic. All you need to do is go back to D&D 3.5 because it's just a better game. There is more customizability, more mechanical depths, and instead of flavoring a mechanic, you can pick a flavor and find a mechanic for it. It's a finished game. There will be no more new supplementary books. Nothing's gonna change, for better or worse. Wodk is not earning money off of it. You can get it for free. It's got better OGL. And you already hate Hasbro. So even if I'm wrong about the system reference document being available for no charge, just pirate it. So, you have to learn the rules somehow, and the place to start is at making your character. For simplicity's sake, I'm gonna narrow it down to what's in the player's handbook. So that's 7 races and 11 classes. And you might ask, 7 races? 11 classes? Where is the customizability? Where are the options? Well, in 50 other books, which can provide you with a thousand classes. Now, granted, some are repeats because they appear in another book, some are NPC classes, and some are just variant options for whatever you pick. But trust me, it's not that 50 books were released, continually repeating a wizard, a wizard, a wizard, and so on. So what do we start with? I don't know. Let's pick it at random. Race number 5, which would be... Half-Elf. And the class? Sorcerer. Now, some classes actually require a specific alignment. You don't get to be a chaotic evil paladin. You are the holy warrior of your god. You need to stick to its rules. You need to be lawful. And you need to be good. If you're not good, you're not a paladin. You're most likely a, some sort of a death knight. Clerics need to be aligned with their deity, at least in half. Some need to be chaotic, but we've got a freedom of choice. Similarly, races described in the books have this awful, racist, discriminatory information about what the population of the species is. Now, as a player, you can play according to the type, like being a lawful Asimar, but nothing really stands in the way of you playing against it and being whatever you pick. You are the hero, you are unique, do what you want. The bigger restriction is gonna be your class than your race. You know, nature versus nurture. So that's our fantasy for today. The sort of magical ancestry of fake creatures granting your innate powers of spellcasting. But before all that, we're gonna need stats. And it's the same stats you already know about. Strength helps you hit a target with melee weapons and deal more damage like that. Dexterity helps you hit a target at range, improves your armor class, and governs your initiative. Constitution decides your health. Intelligence takes care of your learning of skills and improves your spells, if applicable. Wisdom is a spellcasting ability for some, and mostly improves your wisdom saving throw. And charisma is the way you influence other people. In our case, it will also influence our spells. All the attributes or abilities also modify your skill checks. Now, what's the generation method for your stats? You know it already. A standard array, roll 4d6 and drop lowest, or point by. The Dungeon Master's Guide gives you the points you want to go with. For simplicity's sake, I'm gonna take a standard array, which is 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. What modifiers do those values give us? The same as in D&D 5. Sorcerers are primary spellcasters, so they're not gonna be focusing on hand-to-hand -hand combat. Dexterity will help us avoid some hits, and avoiding damage altogether is better than tanking them but we don't have many hit points in the first place, so we're gonna give ourselves a bump there. Intelligence for skills, and our neutral wisdom will not ruin our base saving throws. So we know our strengths and weaknesses. Now let's see how does a half-elf influence our choices. Mechanically, half-elves are medium-sized, which is not just a flavor. Your size is a mechanic. If you're larger, you're automatically stronger. If you're smaller, you are weaker, but you're harder to hit. A medium character gets plus zero, to armor class and plus zero to all his attacks. A small creature gets plus one armor class because of its size and plus one to attack. How is this good? A small creature fighting a small creature is relatively the same 
so the bonuses nullify. However, a smaller creature has an easier time hitting a larger creature, like a medium one, or even larger. No luck for us though, we're painfully average. Land speed of 30 feet, nothing different. Immunity to sleep spell and similar magical effects, and a plus 2 racial bonus on saving throw against enchantment spells or effects. All the effects are categorized in Extraordinary, which are not magical, Supernatural, which are magical, and Spell-like, which function like spells, but the creature isn't preparing anything in advance. It either has the power or doesn't. So if someone casts a sleep spell on us, it won't work. However, if the monster isn't really using any invocations and gestures, but still uses magic to cause that effect, we're gonna be in the clear as well. Plus two racial bonus on saving throws against enchantment spells or effects, gives us plus two to every saving throw, and the effects are clearly labeled as being enchantment. It's not a matter of charmed condition that only some enchantment spells or spell-like abilities or supernatural abilities have. If it's an enchantment, you're likely to resist. Easier. Low light vision, which is not the dark vision, allows you to see in a faint light of candles and torches further than anything else that doesn't have that ability. It is not automatically granted to those who have dark vision though. Just like it says here, we're gonna be able to see twice as far as human in starlight, moonlight, torchlight and similar conditions of poor illumination. Also in color, our longer ears and keener eyes also give us help with listening, searching and spotting things. Those are skills. Listen and spot are two separate things for perception and search is investigation. With how cute we are, we also get plus two racial bonus to diplomacy and gather information checks. Diplomacy is persuasion and gather information is talking to people and getting some rumors, which you could use investigation for. When it comes to things you need to be an elf for, you are and you automatically know common and elven language. With your intelligence as an elf, you can also pick from every other language other than secret languages such as druidic. And what's a favorite class? The thing that you get the most experience for. Because multiclassing is not an optional rule here. It's always available to you. Alright, so let's put some things in. Our plus two against enchantment is gonna be situational, so we're not gonna put it in any hard modifiers in the table. Our speed is 30, our dexterity modifier is 2, and we get some racial bonuses for skills. This is a digital sheet, so it automatically fills in some things. But if you got a piece of paper, I advise you to just write down everything. So we're always racially better at listening, spotting, searching, talking to a lot of people. And that's that. Now since we've got armor class filled in, you'll obviously notice that we've got touch and flat-footed armor class. There are these things called touch attacks. In these cases, the attacker needs to just make contact with your body. Think of it like a flamethrower. It's a weapon attack that if the fuel hits you, you're on fire, no matter what armor you're wearing. Touch armor class involves dexterity, size, deflection, some miscellaneous, but no armor shield or natural armor. So that's 10 plus our dexterity in this case. Flat-footed is the opposite. When you're surprised, you can't dodge out of the way at all. And the only thing that will save you is your armors, or shields, or natural armor, or deflection, or some miscellaneous modifiers. Size modifier is a part of it as well. If we don't get our dexterity but do get everything else which is zero, our armor class for getting hit when surprised is just 10. But I hear you asking, where are the ability score modifiers from your race? The half-elf doesn't have any. If you were a dwarf, you could have gotten a bonus here and there. If you were a full elf, you would have gotten some bonuses. But as a half-elf, we get skill bonuses that are equal to essentially plus 4 charisma and plus 2 wisdom and the ability to see the dark. So what do we do now? Well, from now on, for your character progression, you're gonna need these two tables. Table 316, the sorcerer, which specifically addresses the strength you gain as a sorcerer. And table 32, experience and level dependent benefits. This one tells you how you grow in power as a character altogether, no matter your class. Remember how in D&D 5 you can pick 3 levels of one class and 5 in the other, resulting in level 8 character, but since you multiclassed before level 4, you missed out on an opportunity for an ASI, and the only real benefit of you being level 8 now is that your cantrips got stronger? Here, when your character reaches a given level, you always get those things. You always get an ability score increase, you always get feats, your skills always increase in maximum rank, and you never miss out on general things when you multi-class. 
So at the start, our innate spellcaster gets a base attack bonus of 0, which represents that this class is not focusing on hitting things, or that it doesn't need to worry about full armor class, because you'll have spells that target only touch AC. That also contributes to how well you're gonna grapple enemies, which is pretty much the same action as in D&D 5, only better. Your fortitude and reflex saves are low, starting at 0, but your will starts at plus 2, which represents your focus on magic, how you wield it and how you defend from it, the strength of your mind, rather than focus on your body. And there are only three saving throws. Fortitude represents the ability of your body to resist change, reflex your reaction speed, and will the ability of your mind to resist change. Your special ability is Summon Familiar, that lets you get a loyal pet that will give you some benefits in return, but it can also be a very useful tool, for instance for casting spells. It is quite expensive though, and you most likely won't be able to afford it at the very beginning, because the ritual costs quite some money. However, you will earn enough at the end of your first adventure. And of course, the most importantly, the ability to cast spells. You start off with 5 spell slots for your cantrips and 3 for your first level spells. Your spell save DC is calculated by taking the base 10, adding the spell level and your spellcasting modifier, which in our case is plus 2. For cantrips it will be then 12 and for the first level spells 13. With a value of your spellcasting attribute come additional spells per day. As a caster, keep in mind the table 1-1 ability modifiers and bonus spells. Your spellcasting ability must be high enough to cast the difficult spells, or any spells for that matter. What's the score that you need? Simple. Take the spell level and add 10. So for first level we need 11 charisma. We have 15 so we're already able to cast 5th level spells, but we will be improving that ability score eventually reaching 19 and being able to cast the most powerful magics. So, since our charisma is 15, we get plus one first level and plus one second level spell slots. The additional second spell level slot is not gonna matter until we advance in levels and gain the ability to actually cast those spells, but it will take effect immediately and automatically after you hit the required level. Since we're already down here, and we start off with common and elvish language, our intelligence of 12 gives us plus one modifier, which means we can just pick another language that we know, and you can pick whatever your race has access to. Let's just go with under common, because it's just an example. So again, our spell save modifier is plus two, so far, because of our attribute, and the arcane spell failure comes into play when you wear armor. Armor sets have their own percentage of arcane spell failure, meaning if you wear it as an arcane caster, so sorcerer, wizard, even bard, you roll a percentile dice, and if you fall below that number, or match it, you just waste the spell. Being proficient in wearing an armor will not fix it, but you can always risk it if you feel your defenses are worth the cost. And generally, they shouldn't be. As a caster, we need to pick our spells. A sorcerer begins play knowing four zero-level spells, also called cantrips, and two first-level spells of your choice. At each new sorcerer level, he gains one or more new spells, as indicated in the table. Sorcerers and wizards share the spell list, and again, there is a lot of spells to pick from, the more books you've got. But if you're starting off with a player's handbook, it's fine. Pick whatever looks cool or useful. It's your first character, maybe you won't be optimal, but if you pick what interests you, you'll have fun. Mind your choices, however. The spell descriptions may vary from their D&D 5 counterparts. Let's go with Detect Magic, Daze, Prestidigitation, and Mage Hand. For level 1, let's go with Grease and Cause Fear. That's the spells you know. For now, the choice is limited, but your greatest strength is being able to cast any as many times as you want to and can. You don't even have to prepare them. But remember, you can cast only 5 cantrips per day. They're not infinite, they run out. Be mindful of your resources. And if you're low, just fall back on your crossbow. In this section of the character sheet, we've also got our carrying capacity. And in 3, it's basically the variant encumbrance, only with 3 brackets. And there is a table for that. If you're not increasing your strength like we want to be, you just need to look at this table once, note down the values and you're done with it. The table 9-1 carrying capacity tells us that for strength 8, our light load is 26 pounds or less. When we're carrying this much or less, we move at our maximum speed. 
if we were carrying between 27 to 53. We're on medium load and table 9-2 tells us our speed is lowered, we get a penalty of 3 to all skill checks and our maximum dexterity for armor class drops down to only a modifier of plus 3. If we'll reach a heavy load, which is 54 to 80 pounds for us, our maximum dexterity for armor class can only be plus 1, the check penalties grow to 6 and our speed is still lowered, but we also can't sprint at the maximum speed. Those values with a handy little cheat sheet down here also tell us what kind of weight can you manipulate. You can lift 80 pounds over your head, you can deadlift 160 only off of the ground and push or drag 400. Keep in mind that the size of your character also influences these numbers, because 3.5 is realistic. Smaller characters can carry less and larger ones more. In addition, if you're a quadruped, like a dog, a centaur or a horse, your carrying capacity also increases. Here is a fun little thing. These brackets are exclusive, meaning if you're carrying, in our case, 26 pounds or less, you're in light load. If you're carrying 27 to 53, you're in medium. But what if you're carrying 26 and a half? And there are things that weigh half a pound. The decision is up to you and your group. And now for one of the best features, the skills. Our character level is of course 1, which means our maximum rank for class skills is 4 and cross class skill only 2. What does that mean? Ranks are the points you can spend on your skills. And the beautiful thing about skills in 3rd edition is that they grow when you decide to, not when you're allowed or accidentally grow in some other area. The formula for max ranks is your level plus 3 and for cross class skills is that divided by 2. As a sorcerer, your class skills, or the skills you're proficient in, are Bluff, Concentration, Craft, Knowledge Arcana, Profession, and Spellcraft. With that, it's best to mark on your sheet, which are yours, so you don't have to look for this section of the rules next time you're spending your skill points. So Sorcerers are good at Bluff, because they're charismatic, Concentration, because they're casting spells, and yes, every spellcaster is naturally proficient at saving throws that allows them to maintain concentration on the spell. Craft, which is creating things, not magical ones. You want to weave baskets, make candles, make armor, you can pick it and make a living. A modest one compared to an adventurer's life, but this is your job. Knowledge Arcana, because you're an arcane spellcaster, so you know what's going on in that field of study. Profession, just like craft, only more services than production, like a sailor or an astronomer or even a gambler. And Spellcraft, which is knowledge about spells specifically, that allows you to recognize spells being cast and prepare for them better in the next round of combat. In all these skills, it costs us only one point by one rank for it. And the next beautiful thing about skills in D&D 3.5 is even if you're not proficient, if it's not your class skill, you can still learn it. You think you want to ride a horse? Start spending points on it. With all the charisma that we've got from being an elf, Maybe you want to bump diplomacy. You've got high charisma, you're a sorcerer, you're the face of the party, go ahead. The only caveat is that it's a bit more difficult. Every point we spend buys us half a rank. And really, you can buy half a rank and denote it on your sheet. Only in D&D 3.5, we round everything down. So even if your result is 15 and a half, it's still just 15. And this is fine, because you might end up with an odd number of skill points to spend. You can't keep them for later, and you have to have the ability to spend them. But how much points to spend do we get? Well, on first level, it's 2 plus intelligence modifier times 4. Our intelligence modifier is 1, so it's 3 times 4, 12. On every other level, you just don't multiply it, and get a fresh pool to spend every time you level up. Our 12 points are gonna go into concentration, because we are casting spells, and 4 is the maximum that we can buy at this level. Remember, level plus 3, that's 4. Knowledge Arcana, if you have a wizard in your party, maybe he can take it up, but if not, you might as well be the guy that does it. Another 4. Spellcraft, we are a spellcaster, that's another 4. And since we are gonna be pumping Charisma, we could go with Bluff, that is our class skill, or Diplomacy that we've got a bonus to from our race. In this situation, I think it would be actually better to just lie to people and go with Bluff, because it will pay off in the long run, as you'll be able to spend more points on it, and plus two will quickly lose relevance compared to the ranks you've bought. But also with pumping Charisma as our primary stat, 
Our diplomacy will on average be better than someone that's not trained at all. However, we won't put 4 more points into bluff at this time because we don't have any left. This is more of a strategy for later if you decide to cut down on Arcana and wonder how you're gonna support your team in social interactions or if you just so happen to end up with more intelligence in the beginning. A wizard would be naturally better at knowledge checks than you and if no one does the social role in your party, in this situation I'd advise bluff. Now you'll notice there are some squares next to some skills on the list. That means you don't have to put ranks into the skill to be able to roll for it. Everyone knows how to look for things. Everyone knows how to tiptoe around. Maybe they won't be very effective, but nothing will stop you from trying. Things like opening locks, having specific knowledge, or do an athletic roll to avoid damage or attacks is something you need to practice for, i.e. have ranks in. Every skill is precisely described and defined in the book. It also tells you how much does it take to perform such skill. Some can take an actual effort not best suited for combat like diplomacy, taking 10 minutes, and some don't even require action, like just remembering what you know. And now for the grand finale, the feats. Here, feats are not an optional rule. They're mandatory. They're not instead for something else. They're their own development. Everyone gets a feat every three levels, and you get extra feats based on your class table. And they're one of the most important ways to personalize and distinguish your character from every other in this class, a major part in growing stronger. These feats are not just, you have photographic memory, or you can use a cantrip instead of an attack of opportunity. They're things like, your skills are better, your saving throws are better, your spell DC is higher, the creatures you summon come pre-buffed, You've got a cancerous cyst that allows you to cast spells no one else can. Feats to create magic items. You can turn the energy your spell uses to deal damage into something else from fire to ice, from acid to electricity. You can not provoke attacks of opportunity while casting spells when you've got a shield. You can learn meta magic. You can learn to spontaneously add your meta magic to your spells for the cost of rebuking an undead. You can get another attack if you down an enemy to strike another enemy next to you. You can get an additional attack. You can deflect lasers with your bare hands. Feats are numerous, strong, mandatory, useful and valuable. And at level 1, everyone gets a feat. So what do we want for our sorcerer here? So I think it would be a good idea to take heightened spell metamagic feat. This will allow you to essentially upcast any spell you've got to a spell level you have access to. But you can pick whatever sounds cool and you meet the requirements for. The last information we need to finish off our character is the hit dice, which is Demimish D4. Of course on first level you do get maximum hit points comprised of your hit dice and constitution modifier so for us it will be 5. Our weapon and armor proficiency is all simple weapons, no armor or shields, gear and money. For this quick build we're just gonna take the suggested starting gear. It's for a human but we're not that different. It's mostly about size and if your species has any additional proficiencies in weapons you could reach for, it would have given you a greater advantage in combat. So for us it's gonna be short spear, light crossbow, backpack, water skin, one day's trail rations, bedroll, Sack, hooded lantern, 5 pints of oil for it, spell component pouch, case with 10 crossbow bolts, and flint and steel. We also get to roll 3d4 for our gold pieces that we just so happen to not have been able to spend on our starting gear. Roll that, and you're set. And that's our character done. But the learning has just begun. There is a lot of differences between D&D 5 and 3 when it comes to rules, what you can do in combat, how you can use your skills, how the economy works, and how the magic items operate. If you want to know more, grab yourself a player's handbook or ask me very nicely to make more videos about it. In the meantime, show this to your friends, check out my other videos about way different topics, subscribe and vote with your wallet.